more joining us pretty quick, but this is the fourth of our um, monthly seminars that we started in August on Christian art history. And uh, the one today is gonna be uh, uh, a very interesting one. It's gonna be about history to uh, 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 introduce a devotion. Uh, Josh, would you give us the next slide? <clears throat> Uh, just a little information. I think if you join us before, you won't need it, but you provided an outline of the presentation. And uh, it's kind of like this. If, if you've got that, it, it's helpful to have a printout, follow along. Um, we want you all to mute your sound during the presentation because you've got dogs barking or telephones ringing. It'll disrupt us a little bit. And then near the end, uh, Josh is going to open it up for questions. So we'll unmute at that point. And we will have a recording of this. We do, Josh is doing that now, and it'll po be posted on our uh, church website uh, next week. And uh, uh, we already have recordings of the first three seminars that are on there. So you can, at the bottom of your notes, you can access those. That there's, you've got that same link there. Next slide. I think all of you have nearly met Josh Simmons and uh, certainly have enjoyed him. I, we have. Uh, uh, He's just done a great job for us. And uh, John's got his a BA in history and Christian thought, and he has a master's in church history at Westminster Theological Seminary. He's uh, the associate head of the um, uh, Regents Classical School in Austin, where my grandchildren go. And, and he's uh, some of our grandchildren have gone on uh, uh, trips with him to, the, to Europe. Uh, he teaches over there, he teaches courses in ancient history and classical history and modern European and American history and apologetics. And then um, and on most summers, probably not this one, but on most summers, he's been leading the students over there on summer tours to include the Louvre and Westminster Abbey and others. And uh, our daughter Sloan was telling us about hers uh, just a few days ago. Joe's been married, Josh's been married 18 years, his wife, Erin, they have children. And uh, pass it over to the next slide and see what we got. Okay, I think we're ready to start, Josh. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. I was I have um, I've really enjoyed these uh, these three sessions we've done so far. I hope this one is enjoyable too. I'd like to thank um, thank the worship place, thank Dan for the opportunity to do this. Um, and Dan approached me back sometime in the summer, I guess, about <laughs> about doing these, and uh, I was really excited. And they've been. Uh, They've lived up to my expectations of how, how fun I thought they were going to be. So I hope that they've been uh, beneficial and of interest um, to y'all. And I thank you for sticking with us through these uh, all these. And today we're going to turn from kind of say, the historical stuff we've been looking at um, into the more personal. So if you think about what we've looked at over the first three lessons, we've talked about uh, Christian symbolism. You know, the way in which symbolism is used to depict certain things and color. Um, we spent a lot of time on that in the first, uh, the first one. Then we looked at just kind of how Christian art is shaped by different movements of art through history, how people, how Christians have used the, the movements and time periods of their own to try to reflect Christian truth in particular ways. And we're going to be continuing to build off that here today. And then, um, then last week we looked at churches and architecture and the role in, in which the, the church building itself plays in um, establishing a worship environment for us um, to worship. And now we're moving kind of as think about like to ourselves personally, like how can I use art in a devotional life for myself, for my family, for a small group at church, that type of thing. How can we do that? That's going to be the focus of, uh, of today that we're going to. So when we talk about Christian art and devotion, uh, so here we've got a picture. This is Rublev's Trinity. We've seen that one a couple times. It's a Russian piece um, depicting uh, the three persons of the Trinity gathered there around um, some food to eat. Um, we'll come, maybe come back to that one a little bit later. But first, anytime we're looking at art, is art can sometimes be kind of overwhelming to us. Where we're like, what do we do with this? There's so much going on, particularly if you're at a place like the Louvre or the National Gallery, where it's just painting after painting after painting. It can sometimes be, be overwhelming. And so I think there's a, a few questions. I call them five good questions to ask about art. So anytime you're looking at something, you're like, I don't know what's going on here. If you kind of work through these five questions, I think you'll, it'll help you kind of think about what's actually going on, help you see what's taking place there. 
So the first question is, is just what is it? Like, what do you think is being depicted here? Um, you know, are we looking at, uh, is it a sculpture? Is it a painting? I mean, just, just keep it very simple. And I mean, like, you know, some of the clues and things. Okay, is there a woman in blue? Okay, could that possibly be Mary in this scene? Oh, there's a guy on a crucifix. That's probably Jesus, right? Unless we have a real good reason to think it's somebody other than Jesus, which we'll see an example of. Somebody being crucified is not Jesus um, here today. But um, there's things like, you know, just, just ask those types of questions because that will help you get into what the artist was trying to get across. Um, most artists are not trying to be subtle about the points they're making. They want you as the observer to, to get something from the, the pre what they're doing. So and just what is it? And just kind of defining those, those ideas of kind of what, what does it seem to be um, can be a real helpful place to start. Second, you know, what seems to be the setting of this piece of art? Because that can sometimes contribute to other things. You know, what's the time and the place of things? Um, particularly when we look at some of the, the pictures in relationship to scriptural passages, asking, okay, where is this picture taking place in light of the uh, the art in front of us? Um, as I'm thinking about walking through this now, say two good examples of this are uh, the two Davids from the Renaissance, two really famous Davids from the Renaissance, the M Michelangelo's, which we've looked at before, and then their Donatello's. They both take place at different times in the story. Um, we know this because in, the, in Michelangelo's David, right, the, he's holding the rock in his hand, he's got the slingshot, so it's obviously pre the slaying of the giant. Whereas in Donatello's uh, David, he's holding the head of the giant. <laughs> so we're after the uh, the death of Goliath, right? So there's something else going on. So asking you know, how how might the, the the particular point in time or moment that's being presented here? What's the artist saying about that? And why did they you think they chose to depict this part of it rather than maybe some other aspect of it? Why did they choose that? It can be a helpful way to get into it. Third question, how does this compare to other things that I'm familiar with? The more art you look at, the more you see around the world, the more opportunities you have to compare things with each other. So you might look at something and be like, I'm not sure what that is. But after, you, after you've seen a bunch of them, you might be like, oh, this is a, maybe it's a Madonna and child, which they're all kind of similar in a lot of ways. Or maybe it's a, it's a nativity scene where there's Mary and baby Jesus and Joseph and the shepherd have those same parts, but they all work differently in, in the different styles and presentations of what they're doing. But comparing it to other things can help you sometimes see the particular piece you're looking at in relief to the others uh, things and you help you kind of see it more clearly for what it is. What do you think the artist is trying to accomplish and why? Okay, so notice the first two are kind of objective questions, or just what are you looking at? What are you seeing? The third one is now asking you to then reflect upon things you're familiar with. So you can kind of put this particular piece into kind of a general orbit of other things that you're familiar with. And it's only now that we get to the point of asking, well, what is the artist trying to accomplish? Now that I've kind of, um, I've identified what it is, what seems to be going on, I've talked through maybe the use of colors or things like that, then um, kind of, situated in a particular style maybe I'm like oh this looks like a romantic piece but i remember the some of the principles of romanticism I, I think i'm seeing here then what is the artist trying to accomplish and why what are they trying to get across to um us as the audience what's the point they're trying to make and, and i mean there are probably right and wrong answers to this but unless the artist has told you you may not really ever know the answer to this question <laughs> and that's and that's okay but it can help you just Put yourself in their shoes as someone doing the creative work. What what might they be trying to, to get at to get through uh, the point here? And then finally, how does this make me think about the event or the idea under consideration? How does looking at this and thinking about this piece of art make me think maybe a little bit differently about uh, this picture in scripture, or this uh, imagery in scripture? Maybe it's like you know, like Rublev trinity right like uh, that's not how i would picture the trinity in my mind but at the same time that makes me raise the question of like well how would i picture the trinity if i was trying to picture the trinity <laughs> that's a difficult concept to to wrap uh, one's mind around which then pushes us into kind of the infinity and the uh, the the otherness of god in that sense that is really difficult for us to kind of wrap our minds around because he's so much greater um than we are there so and those are those kind of five questions. We'll kind of come back to those uh, periodically as we work work through some of the pieces we're going to be looking at. But these are just kind of some simple questions, just help you kind of think through art as you're looking at it. 
right. So I've got kind of two sections to this uh, to this talk. The first I've called art in time. Uh, we're going to be looking at kind of the Christian year and devotional art in light of that. And then the second section is going to be more kind of uh, particular, maybe passages in the scripture that with tied with art that you could use again, either in personal devotion, or if you were leading a small group devotion, you could be like, okay, so, you know, we know we're, we're coming to this point in, in scripture. Okay, let's look at this piece of art as, and maybe we'll look at it. Maybe let's read the scriptural passage. We can discuss the scriptural passage and then come back and be like, well, how is the artist depicting this? Do, do we like the way they're presenting it or not? Or do you think maybe they're missing something that's seems really key out of the passage. Why do we think maybe they left that off? It can serve as a great tool for discussion. Um, that's something that's beyond just the uh, the scripture passage, and you can kind of bring them into conversation with each other. And that'll be the second, uh, the second part of this. So first, um, art in time. So um, liturgical churches, and increasingly I'm finding a lot more Protestant churches, um, even kind of more low church Protestant churches, have started adopting certain aspects of the Christian year. Um, the Christian year is a 12-month uh, cycle, but it's not centered around months. It's centered around uh, events in the life of Christ, especially, and the church. And so it looks like this, roughly. Okay, it starts with Advent, Advent is time of preparation for the coming of Christ. So in a lot of churches, the uh, scripture readings during Advent are Old Testament related, tending towards kind of like prophesying for the Messiah, that kind of thing, looking in that direction for the coming of Christmas. Then um, after Christmas, we get Epiphany, which is the, uh, the wise men coming and kind of the first spreading of the gospel, we might say, to outside the, the Jewish community is that Epiphany. Then we move into ordinary time. This is just the normal life of the church. Uh, nothing special really going on until we get to Lent. Lent is the time of preparation for um, for Easter and for Good Friday, especially the, the Triduum is what it's called, which starts with Good Friday uh, and Holy Saturday. And then, um, then Easter, time of celebration, celebrating the resurrection of Christ, um, up to Pentecost, the, the giving of the Holy Spirit, and the sending out of the church to go and be witnesses for Christ to the world, right? Fulfilling the, the Great Commission of Matthew 28, which gets us into the big chunk of ordinary time that goes from Pentecost, which is normally in, in late May, early June, up until uh, the start of Advent again. So um, this Coming Sunday is the last Sunday of ordinary time before Advent begins again. And so the last Sunday is always Christ the King Sunday. It's a, it's a, readings are typically from Revelation on this day. And it's so you see the whole scope of, of I might say, biblical revelation or biblical history plays out over the course of the year. In Advent, we're starting with creation, fall. Why do we even need a Redeemer to come to us at Christmas? What makes Christmas a great thing? is because of the, the work that we see throughout the Old Testament of the prophets laying the, the foundation for our need for, uh, for forgiveness, for a Savior, that we can't do it ourselves. So then we get Christmas, then we move into kind of ordinary time. But then you know, in our lives, right, most of our life is ordinary. Things are just happening normally. And then we have like, you know, big things kind of pop out. You know, it's, it's we get married or with birth of our children or a great trip we went on or a great new job. Like, those things pop out, but they're not the norm of life. <laughs> life is normally ordinary. And so the, the, the church year is established in kind of the same way, that most of the time is ordinary with these handful of times that really kind of pop out. And they have very specific um, colors typically tied to them. Um, there's a little bit of variation sometimes on Advent. Sometimes Advent's purple like Lent is. Sometimes it's a royal blue. It kind of depends upon the, the Christian tradition and what uh, point they're trying to emphasize there. A royal blue is typically connected with it let's say royalty, with the idea of, um, of Mary. Again, we've seen blue in that regard. I think the importance of the, the coming, the mother of Christ who's bringing uh, the Christ into the world. Um, purple is oftentimes associated with um, uh, repentance, penitence. Um, and so that's why it's the color of Lent. Um, so sometimes Advent's also purple because Advent is sometimes like in the Orthodox tradition, Advent is called um, the Little Lent. Um, it's a shorter period of time than Lent is, et cetera. So you can see those things. But in reality, these two, the, the year as a whole is centered around two particular things, the two major events, we might say, of human history, 
right? The first is the incarnation, right? Advent, Christmas, Epiphany are the, the points around the incarnation. God becoming man, you know, as John 1 says, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word became flesh, right? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, right? The incarnation, that's an amazing thing. The otherness of God, the infinite, all-powerful becoming a little baby, right? And we celebrate that at Christmas, and it's an amazing thing. Um, if you're interested in, in reading some stuff on this that I've, I've found really helpful myself, G.K. Chesterton has a great uh, book called The Everlasting Man, but the second half of that book is really, uh, the first half of the second half is centered around Christmas and how amazing it actually is. And this Christmas is just one of those things that we kind of take for granted. If you've grown up in a, in a Christian family and house, it's like, oh, Christmas comes around. But the, the idea of God himself, you know, all powerful, all knowing, all being, becoming a little baby is just like, that's just mind blowing stuff that we can sometimes take for granted because we just get so used to it. But Christmas is an amazing thing, the entrance of the divine into this world, right? But God didn't just come to this world uh, just to come, just to show he could do it, right? He comes to the world to die on the cross on our behalf to give us uh, the redemption of our sins. So that's the only way that could be done. And so the second kind of major part of the year is centered around the death and resurrection of Christ. All right. So we've got the incarnation and we've got the resurrection and kind of those two times with ordinary time kind of splitting them up. Right. And that's kind of the structure of the Christian year with these particular um, particular times there. Um, Pentecost, you know, see there is, is always red. I'm sure you can think about why that is, right? Because Pentecost is, is uh, the, the, the spirit descends like tongues of flame, fire on, um, on the heads of people. Um, and again, if you go to like a, like a Catholic or an Orthodox or an Anglican service church, that's very, um, it's very liturgical. Priests will sometimes wear red on, on martyrs' days, as we again talked before about how red is a color of martyrdom. But Pentecost is the primary day that red shows up. You kind of see the other colors that uh, show up normally in the vestments of the uh, the minister, but might also be in decorations in the church and that kind of thing. So that's kind of the Christian year. You've got these two main things: the incarnation and then the death and resurrection are the two uh, centerpieces of the Christian uh, the Christian world. Let's look at then some art connected with the Incarnation. We're coming up on, on that uh, here soon. So the first Sunday of Advent is the Sunday after Thanksgiving. Um, and so we're moving into kind of that, uh, that time period here. This here is one of my favorite uh, Advent pieces. I don't know who did it. I haven't been able to find um, an author for it. But it's called the proto Evangelium, which means the first gospel. Um, and here we have Eve on the left, right, and Mary together um, and, and the point is that Mary's, you know, basically consoling Eve, that, right, like her sin, and she's holding the apple, she's got the snake wrapped around her, right? Her sin is being undone or, or, or covered over by the work that her baby is going to do. And I think the parallelism of the two of them, the look on Mary's face, it's this kind of this, this compassion in light of Eve's kind of sorrow for what she's done, is I think, I think it's just a beautiful, simple um, image. And so if we think about, you know, the, the proto Evangelium uh, scholars typically say the first example of the gospel is Genesis 3.15, where um, right after the fall, uh, God is walking in the garden with them and explaining to them the consequences of what's happened. And, um, and he says this to the uh, to the snake. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And then to the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing and pain. You shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. Right. And so it seems like Mary here is making these things kind of right by being the bearer of the Messiah, the one who is coming to bruise the heel. Some translations say crush the head of the uh, um, of the serpent. Um, notice, if you notice though, this picture, though, right? Notice that it's, it's Mary who is standing on the head 
of the serpent here. Um, in some textual variations of Genesis 3.15, the pronouns are feminine. Um, so instead of it being he, it would be, you know, so you got the enmity there at the beginning, enmity between you and the woman. It continues through the whole thing. She shall bruise your head and you shall bruise her heel. And so some, um, uh, sometimes that's how it gets translated was that feminine. I don't think that's probably the best translation. I think there's probably a copying error in the Middle Ages that made it happen. But it is a, a textual variant out there. And so you'll sometimes see depictions of uh, Mary crushing the head of the serpent. And it comes from that textual variation from Genesis 3, uh, 3.15 there that, that pops up sometimes. So um, I like this. A couple of years ago, in a way that kind of art, I think about from a devotional life point of view, um, a couple of years ago, a few Christian artists wrote um, a poem about uh, Mary and Eve. I don't know if it was necessarily connected with this work of art, but I think it goes very well with it. So I'm going to pull that up and, and we'll read that and you can kind of see how they kind of played with this idea. Right? So it's called Mary Consoles Eve, which is what I think is a great example of what this picture is showing. This is Mary speaking, right? Eve, my sister, the one who took the fall. Eve, my sister, mother of us all. Lift up your head. Don't hide your blushing face. The promised one is finally on his way. Almost, not yet, already. Almost, not yet, already. Eve, it's Mary. Now I'm a mother too. The child I carry, a promise coming true. This baby comes to save us from our sin, a servant king, his kingdom without end. Almost, not yet, already. Almost, not yet, already. He comes to make his blessings flow as far and wide as the curse is found. He comes to make his blessings flow. Almost, not yet, already. Almost, not yet, already. Soon. Eve, my sister, the one who took the fall. Eve, my sister, mother of us all. The promised one is finally on his way. And I think that that I almost not yet already kind of like repetition thing there is I think in some ways it's like like that like Advent is about preparation for the birth of of Christ, right? And as you think about it, if you have, have been a parent, um I think I think the mothers here can probably connect to this most fully, more so than I can, certainly. But there's that sense of like expectation as you get closer and closer to to the day of birth. Like the number of times I remember my wife would be like, "Oh, I, th I think this is this is it. These are the contracts." And like, "Oh no, it's just one of the the Braxton Higgs ones. That's you know, it's like a, a preparatory contraction." And it's whenever it becomes real, it's always like, "Oh yeah, that's right. This is the real thing." But the setups for it kind of are like, "Oh." This may be it. No, but you're you're kind of like on on the edge of your seat with anticipation. I think that's kind of the the, the goal of Advent is that when we get to Christmas, we remember how much we've been in need of a Savior, how much we need one to come and save and redeem us. Here is a uh, unusual. Um, Piece, which is why I picked it. It's interesting. We've looked at some stuff by uh, by William Blake before, a uh, poet. Uh, so this is very romantic, early 1800s. It's unusual in a variety of ways, right? So we have it. It's a nativity scene. Obviously, we've got Jesus there in the middle. I like that Jesus is kind of like floating <laughs> there all by himself. Notice um, his hands and in, in configuration are um, almost like a like a crucifixion, right? They're kind of stretched out. There, um, it's a kind of a, a foretelling of the fact that his uh, that's that's where his life is going is to death. Now, that's an unusual thing about this is notice Mary is not wearing blue at all, <laughs> no blue on Mary at all. The blue figure is Joseph, who's kind of supporting her after giving birth. We have um, you know these women present and another child which maybe that's John the Baptist here, maybe. Obviously not in Scripture, right? If you're using this in comparison to us to uh, the scriptural accounts, we don't get accounts of any other people there at the actual birth, right? The shepherds will show up later after the angels come and talk to them. We do get the oxen in the background, though. That's nice. It's very stylized. I think um, we've got either Adam or Eve here at the front. It's not clear. I think um, Eve would be my guess, but I don't think it's quite obvious whether it's a male or female figure there at the bottom. But in the point being here, right, that like 
that death has come into the world because of the sin of our first parents. And now it's through the work of Christ that that redemption is coming, right? Life is coming to the world through Christ. Then we have the Holy Spirit depicted in an unusual way of above, um, kind of overshadowing everything. If you think about when uh, um, uh, the angel comes to Mary initially, right, and says the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Most High will overshadow you um, and come upon you. That seems to be the depiction that Blake's going for here, but it's very kind of stylized, emotional. One thing to note, though, if you look at like the shape of the, the little... Uh, uh, hut that they're in the, the 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 barn stable area it and this is where it might be like well, does it remind you of anything you know as you look at that this shape and structure particularly the interior um I'll give you a second to kind of look at that and see if it kind of reminds you of anything maybe we looked at that we've looked at before It reminds me, as I look at it, of the structure of a church. And we looked at those basilica structures. We've got the, the big section in the middle and then the smaller sections outside, the way those arches are going up like that. Um, it's it's certainly not architectural for that building that's there. So I think he's making a point that you know, this is the beginning of the church, we might say. It's here uh, at the birth of Jesus. So interesting, interesting piece. I like it because it's a little, it's a little kind of jarring at first. Everything looks a little unnatural, a little, a little odd, um, and uh, but it makes me reflect upon the passages connected with the things being presented here. Um, here we have uh, this is Rubens. Um, so this is a Baroque piece. Um, some things that kind of tell us this is Baroque very clearly um, are the presence of the angels up above. You remember one of the, the key features of Baroque art from a couple times ago was the way in which the supernatural gets painted into the natural physical world. They don't distinguish those things. So they're showing us sort of the spiritual reality of the world um, that's, that's taking place that, that our fleshly eyes can't see. Um, and so there the angels are up there kind of watching and taking in this uh, this birth. Okay, so here, obviously, we have Mary here on the right. Um, she's in blue again, so she's back in blue. You know, Jesus is laying there. Notice Jesus is the only one who's got a halo. It's a little bit interesting. Yeah, but then we think about, so where is this in the story, right? Who are these people who are here um, looking at Jesus, who have come to Jesus? It seems like these are the shepherds, right? They don't look like the wise men. They look kind of like rude, um, kind of common people um, who are coming to be take of the glory of uh, of Jesus. And notice also, just as you take it in, and Joseph is present. He's in the back, kind of barely there. <laughs> the emphasis is really on uh, Jesus, Mary, and the people coming to, to watch Mary, to look at Mary, and not Mary, Jesus here. Um, and so I think that's the, uh, one of the points I think that's being made here is that we're being told by the, the people coming to Jesus that th their response to the birth of Jesus is kind of what our response should be, right? The guy in red is like looking at the guy behind, and it's almost like he's like he's like pointing to Jesus, like, like, look at this, right? The guy behind is almost like blinded by the glory of it, like, I can't even look at this, right? Um, the woman is, is in an adoration pose, um, and they're in the middle, and then the the guy in the very back, right above Jesus's head, this is a look of kind of peace and contemplation and joy almost on his face as he's looking at uh, the sleeping Jesus being swaddled in the clothes there. Here we have another um, visitation passage. Um, this is a uh, Fabriano's, uh, this is a Renaissance piece, early Renaissance. Um, so we've got Mary there in blue. Uh, here we have the wise men. This is more closely connected to Epiphany rather than uh, Christmas Day. because The wise men are now coming. Notice it's not just the wise men. Right? It's the wise men and a whole bunch of other people who are coming. But the wise men are there first. Again, notice their response, right? They're laying down their crowns before, um, before 
Christ who has reached out and is, is touching the head of the man, kind of like a blessing upon him. Um, we've got, we still, we're still in, got the shepherd, the, the manger going on, right? We've got the cattle and the donkeys are present there. Um, those types of things. But the, um, but the, 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 the key centering is on the, the, the kings who are, are bowing before Christ. And again, that's to remind us that you know, whatever our worldly possessions are, that they all are his. They all belong to Christ. And, um, and that this response is how we should think of ourselves. And we need to come also to worship the Lord. So then we turn towards the resurrection now, an art connected with that. Um, the resurrection cycle of the Christian year begins with Lent, and Lent begins with Ash Wednesday. Um, so here we have two paintings. The one on the left is called Ash Wednesday. Um, so Ash Wednesday follows uh, what's called Fat Tuesday in some traditions, or Mardi Gras is how it's frequently more commonly known, which is Fat Tuesday, um, which is kind of represents the final um, celebration of uh, life before the beginning of the penitential period of, um, of Lent that starts on Ash Wednesday the next day. Um, and so here we have a reveler from Mardi Gras um, there from the night before, but now it's the next day, it's the next morning, right? And you can kind of see as he's sitting there and he's still got his party clothes on, right? But he's sitting there in kind of this state of either maybe dejection or maybe it's just he's reflecting back upon what's been done as he sits in the light of day, what he's done and who he is, and that will then help him remember we see in this other one here, that we need to remember that we're mortal. We are mortal and that we will die. We'll die. And so um, in, in the Middle Ages, it was a common thing. They came back to it in the, sometimes in the neoclassical period, these paintings. Um, so this one here is, is called Vanitas Still Life, I mean, the vanities of, of life in a still life. But they like to put these skulls in paintings as a reminder of death. They were called the memento mori, the, the death reminder, that no matter what it is, no matter where we're at in our life, we have to remember that the day will come when we will die and we will meet God. And that can be a good thing or it can be a terrifying thing, right? As Paul tells us, right, at the, at the name of Christ, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Christ is Lord, right? Whether we want to or not, that will be the confession. And Ash Wednesday is the beginning of the, the process of Lent, of reminding us that, that from dust we are and to dust we shall return. Um, so if, if, again, if you go to a church that celebrates Ash Wednesday, they'll put ashes on your head at Ash Wednesday and they'll say those words, from dust you are and to dust you shall return. This is a reminder of our mortality. We can sometimes think, particularly when we're young, that we've got all the time in the world, everything's going to be going to be great forever, but it's important to remember that we will die. Death is a consequence of sin, and that sin is only overcomable by the one who has defeated death by rising from the dead, which is Christ. So you think about um, there's some, some scripture passages I think you can use with Ash Wednesday. Um, there's Ecclesiastes 3, 19 and 20. Um, this is after the famous passage about the, uh, the that the birds sang about, right? Turn, turn, turn for every everything there is a season. After that bit, um, uh, the the preacher here is reflecting on uh, just kind of the nature of life and this the, the the mortality of it. He says, "What happens to the children of man, and what happens to the beasts is the same. As one dies, so does the other. They all have the same breath." And man has no advantage over the beast, for all is vanity. All go to one place. All are from the dust, and to dust all return. To dust all return. All right, and so this, this idea that you know, if we don't have Christ, if we don't have God, that's, that's the reality. There is no difference between us and the beast. Our life is essentially meaningless in the cosmic story. There's no point. There's no purpose. We're like a, a, a wisp of breath in the life of the cosmic universe, right? It's, but with Christ, now there's purpose. Now there's meaning. Now, yes, we will die, but we can live forever with Christ in light of that. 
Um, a more maybe hopeful passage, but a passage that I think gets to the same point across is in 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 is one of my favorite scripture passages. It's one of the beautiful passages that lays out uh, the gospel as Paul understands it um, and goes through and talks about the importance of the resurrection, how we know the resurrection is true, etc. Um, I'm looking here at, at 15, 46 uh, through 48, uh, 1 Corinthians and this is what Paul says here. He says, it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, the man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so are those who are of heaven. All right. So in order to become, we might say, in order to become a Christian, we have to recognize our sinfulness, our brokenness, our dust worthiness, we might say, and then we can become a Christian. We can move from the natural to the spiritual because we know who we are. We know that we need help. We need something outside of us to come and save us. And Ash Wednesday is a good reminder of that. And so art like this, I think, connects well with Ash Wednesday because it reminds us of our mortality and our need for a savior. Lint, there's a variety of things you can do with Lint. Um, I highly recommend um, for Lint and Advent, they do this also, but Biola, the, uh, the Bible Institute of Los Angeles, they put together a devotional series for both Advent and Lent of daily devotions that they pair. Uh, normally, it's, it's art, music, uh, scripture, and maybe uh, poetry of some kind that all get paired together each day, and they center around kind of the same theme. And um, you can sign up for them and get them emailed to you. So I definitely recommend checking um, checking them out. Biola um, is a great school out, out in Los Angeles uh, that, that they, they have this, this neat program that they send out every year for that. So I'm, I sign up for it every year to get the email, the daily emails with their, uh, their information on that. Uh, jumping ahead now to Good Friday. All right, so here we have uh, the crucifixion of Jesus, right? This is uh, Titian's version. Titian's an early Renaissance master. Um, so we look at the painting and ask, you know, what is here? What's here? Well, obviously, we have Jesus being crucified. Uh, that's pretty clear what's taking place. Notice we have Mary present. She's there in the blue again. We've got uh, two other figures, um, one in red who uh, seems to be like in disbelief almost. And then um, what looks like a monk uh, holding on to uh, the cross and seeking that out. Um, there. And so I think when we think about Good Friday, um, obviously we can go to a variety of passages in the uh, in the Gospels. But um, I think I don't know what passage I have here. This is Matthew's version. But um, it says, uh, so they took uh, Jesus. He went out bearing his own cross to the place called, uh, no, this is John. Sorry, this is John's version. This is John 19, I believe. Yeah. Um, starting verse 16. So they took Jesus and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. Okay. So we notice this. I'm sure you've all seen paintings or depictions of the crucifixion that show the thieves, right? But notice here in Titian's version, he's cut them out. Right there, it's strenuous to the vision that he's trying to get across. He wants everything to be centered around just Jesus. That's all, all we need to need there. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. So I think we talked about this before, but the I-N-R-I -I there at the top that you see on a lot of crucifixions, that's what that is. That's shorthand for Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. But in Latin, it would be Jesus Nazarenus. Rex Judea. Okay, so, so they didn't have the J sound in Latin. So the I's are uh, Jesus and Jews, um, etc. There's, but that's what that's depicting. Many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, "Do not write the King of the Jews, but rather this man said I am King of the Jews." And Pilate answered, "What I have written, I have written." When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier, also his tunic. 
But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it. We will cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture, which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. All right. So as we think about that passage there, so the disciple who Jesus loved is normally uh, considered to be John, the writer of the, the gospel. Right. So it's likely that as we look at this scene we've got here, so we've got Mary there on our left as we're looking at, the, the figure in red is most likely John. Um, who's there uh, at, at the cross. And then the monk is there as kind of us, we might say, right? He's cut out other people, but the monk's there to kind of remind us of kind of like, where do we need to go for salvation? Or where do we go when we need help, right? We turn to the cross. It's only, you know, grasping on the cross and holding on to it that, um, that we have the assurance of our salvation because of what Christ has done on it, and think about all the great hymns of the church that talk about, you know, the rugged cross um, and the importance of that in our lives. So it's almost like the, the monk is a symbol of that for us, as a reminder of how we need to be, um, you know, venerate and treat uh, Christ's cross and what He did, and not lose sight of the importance of that uh, for us. Notice also, though, as we look at this, um, it says, as the passage goes on, we get to like um, 34 of 19 of John. One of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. So if you look at it, right, we can see the, the bloody wound on his right-hand side. So this is, at, this is later than the earlier passage we read. So then maybe he's just died at this point, and um, it's, just, it's just over. He has you know, given up. Um, his spirit, they stabbed his side. Salvation has been accomplished on our uh, on our behalf now as a result of this. But then, of course, glory be to God, it does not end with the crucifixion. It doesn't end with death. It ends with resurrection. All right, and here we have, I don't know who uh, painted these. Our uh, The church I went to for many years on our Easter Sunday bulletins always had this picture on it, and it's always been a been powerful to me for a long time um, because of that. So here we have uh, two disciples rushing to the tomb. Right? And so we turn again to John's gospel and look at the resurrection scene, John 20, uh, 1 through 6. It says, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene, remember she'd been back at the, at the uh, crucifixion, came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. And there's that same phrase, that's one Jesus loved, we saw that earlier, who was also there at the crucifixion. And said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going towards the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloth lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloth lying there. And so here we have you know, Peter and John on their way to the tomb. I think this is a fascinating depiction of this scene, right? The looks on their faces, you know, on John's face, it's almost like too good to be true. Like, could it possibly be true that this has happened, that, that Mary is right about what's happened? And, and Peter's face is just bewilderment, right? but he wants to know, is this is this true? But they're rushing to get to the tomb. And this is the only depiction I know of, of this kind of like in between time between like, Hey, someone has told us that this guy raised from the dead that we all just saw crucified a couple of days before. And all of you see pictures of the empty tomb or the angel on the rock. But that that in the middle of time, I think, is a fascinating depiction. And that this the, the look on their face, their eagerness to find out, is this true? Um, I think is a good model for all of us as well as we think about our own eagerness um, in the uh, in the faith. We have an empty tomb scene. Um, so notice we, there's our linen cloth 
folded up real nicely there. Notice they kept in this in this painting uh, the three crosses in the background. So they kept the three that are mentioned rather than just the one that Titian was focused in on. They made the choice there. I like the imagery of this because notice there's like you get to see both things, right? You have the, the site of the crucifixion and the site of the resurrection together. Because it's really the it's the combination of those two things that's so powerful. The death for our sins and the resurrection to life that you know baptism symbolizes um, later on as we're told uh, by Christ, but that this is, um, they're all interwoven together as we think about the power of the empty tomb. There's lots and lots of, of art connected with the empty tomb and the crucifixion too, it's a pretty big deal. And, um, the last part of kind of the, the connection with the resurrection though is the sending of the Holy Spirit, right? Remember Christ says, it is better for you if I go, right? For I shall send the helper, the advocate to you. And so here we have a copy of Pentecost by the, uh, the painter of Stout, uh, the second. Um, we know it's Pentecost, right? It's pretty clear. Right? We got flame falling. I particularly like the one there in the middle bottom who's like down like worshiping or cowering and the flame hasn't gotten to him yet. <laughs> You see how like the flames like still still on the way, the way there coming from heaven. Um, but you know, this, this is depicting, I think, a variety of things. One, it's depicting, I think, the power and majesty of God is trying to be driven by across here. That you know, this it's a powerful scene um that's being um presented here, and it's causing people to react in different ways to what's going on. Notice again, about there in the middle, it's Mary. She got her blue with her um, there uh, receiving this. So Acts 2, 1 through 4 um, says this. You know, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So here, you know, um, there's a variety of ways, right, you could depict Pentecost. I and mean, we've looked at some other examples of Pentecost um, through our time together. Here, they seem to be going with kind of like the power of God, right? This mighty rushing wind sense of God, right? You can see uh, the people are, most of them are reacting, we might say, in ways that are more uh, scared or, or awe or what, what's happening, right? Mary is kind of a center of peace in the midst of this whole, uh, this whole thing. But there's different ways, you know, that, that the, uh, the flames could have been presented to them. It wouldn't have to necessarily be in such a dramatic <laughs> scene as is laid out for us here. But uh, it is, uh, I think, a powerful, uh, beautiful scene. But it shows us, I think, you know, what would that have been like, right, to have been there on that first day, to have experienced um, the Spirit of God in this direct and powerful way, and then to see the immediate fruits of it in uh, your preaching, ability to speak languages, that type of thing, as a result of the resurrection um, of Christ. Okay, so now let's uh, move in to look at some other uh, kind of passages for a kind of small group or personal uh, devotion. I've got a handful of paintings here connected with particular scripture passages I think you could use um, either to introduce a, a, a devotional time or to um, put in comparison to to serve as another discussion basis for like, how is this artist de depicting this? Is this the way I would have depicted this scene or where along the scene are they depicting? And I thought for this we'd start at the beginning with Genesis. All right, so as Genesis says, right, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's what we see kind of happening here. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. So here, you know, as we look at this, this depiction of Genesis 1, it's not terribly dissimilar from Michelangelo's depiction on the Sistine Ch Chapel. But um, I think it's an interesting piece here. Uh, shift just a little bit. Sun's getting my eyes. There we go. Okay. Um, you know, because Genesis tells us, right, that, that everything's done verbally, right? God spoke and then it happened. Right. But what do we have happening here? Right. We have this this thing that's happening um, in verse four. Right. God separating the light and darkness. In my mind, I've always thought that God just kind of was like light there, 
darkness there and that was kind of the end of it but here it's more of like a god as as creator in like a physical sense god is like physically separating the light from the darkness i'm not sure if that's exactly what happened obviously we don't know how that exactly happened but it, it it made me think more about god as um as craftsman maybe as creator this painting does rather than just the power of god of just being able to just direct by his voice um you go there you go there um i think there's there's value in both those images because as uh, scripture tells us right we are fearfully and wonderfully made right um god cares about beauty as we see in the temple um the tabernacle works the art that's around those things um craftsmanship matters to to, uh, to God. So I think we see here kind of a glimpse of, of the artist trying to pick God as this kind of craftsman uh, dividing these these uh, this light and darkness from each other. Um, here we have, uh, this is a very pretty painting, I would say. Um, this is the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew 5. Um, there's a variety of different versions of this. Let's um, Let's read through Matthew 5, uh, 1 through 12, and kind of talk about this painting in light of that here. So seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. Right, so we can see the disciples, right? They're the ones who are standing close by, but then there's a broader crowd around. Anybody see, can you pick out Judas, you think, among the disciples? Anybody see? You can see Judas. A couple seconds to look. Yeah, I think some of you have found him. Right, he's there kind of behind Jesus under his right elbow, looking back over, kind of not, he's, he's the one who's not turned, kind of facing Jesus in an open way to receive or at least be interested in his teaching. He's, he's looking like he's not happy with the teachings that are coming forth here. And then Jesus speaks, right, the Beatitudes. He opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are uh, the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied, etc., etc., as we know the Beatitudes go on. I notice we've got a variety of different people. People here. We've got women, we've got men, we've got children, we've got old people, right? There's a variety of people here all listening to the teachings of Jesus. Um, but you know, also, what is Jesus? Look at his his body, his physical positioning. When I think about this and I ask myself the question, like, what is what does this remind me of or compare to in anything? The first thing, and the first thing that jumps to my mind is the Statue of Liberty, of all things. <laughs> When I first saw this, you know, Jesus is kind of like you know, holding the stat, the the torch, but he's not holding a torch, right? Because he he doesn't need, he, you know, he is the light. We might say the light's radiating from him. It's not the torch he's holding, but he's pointing to the Father, right? He and the Father are one. As John seventeen tells us, right? He's saying that how you want to know how to get to the Father, how to do this? it's by. Um, through me, going to the Father, come to me is kind of what the left hand is saying. Like it's like an invitation to come to me, and I will take you to the Father. It's kind of the the way in which I kind of see and interpret this. But just looking at the different faces, the way people are listening, you know, some of them over there on the right hand side, right, they're almost like leaning in. They're so eager to hear the the woman down below Jesus's left hand, looking up, um, just with with. And I was like, can she believe what she's hearing Jesus say? Again, these are passages that I think sometimes, you know, we all know the Beatitudes. It, it gets preached on pretty frequently. It's a very common, well-known passage. I think sometimes having a, a visual depiction like this can help kind of pull us out from the, the, oh, yes, I know that. I know how this goes. And be like, oh, what would it have been like to have been there? How would that have, how would that have been? Who, who would I have been in this picture? <laughs> Would I have been Judas? I hope not. Would I have been one of the people who's kind of like, oh, I'm not sure what I think about this, or I'd be one who, who's eager for the words of life that he that he has, that he's giving here. Um, I think it's a way that we can approach uh, using art in our kind of devotional life. All right, another very famous event, obviously, in the life of uh, the church. This is a Caravaggio painting called The Incredulity of Thomas. Um, incredulity, of course, means like the, the lack of believing, or he's known as doubting Thomas, the poor, poor God. And so John 20 gives us this, uh, this passage here. This is 
probably my favorite Caravaggio of all Caravaggios. Well, I like a lot, but I really like this piece. It says, now Thomas, this is verse 24 of John 20. Now Thomas, one of the 12, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and I place my finger into the mark of the nails, and I place my hand into his side, I will never believe. And eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Put out your hand. Place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And then Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. The thing I really like about this painting, right, is the, is the, the there's all these variety of things, but I love that, like, Thomas is, his finger is in the wound of Christ's side. It's literally in there. And the look on his face of just, like, I can't believe those words that I said are coming back, like, they're actually happening right here. I'm doing this. This is amazing, right? The way Jesus is, is guiding Thomas's hand in, because I'm sure Thomas is basically like, Oh, I'm good, Jesus. I see you. You're here. I believe the stories now. Uh, all that bit about wanting to touch everything, and then I believe. No, I'm, I believe. And Jesus is almost like, no, you need, you need this. And he's gently guiding his, his hand into the wound there. And then I particularly like the other two disciples beyond behind Thomas. I feel like Thomas is the guy who gets all the blame for being the one who's like publicly doubting. But I feel like these other two guys are like secret doubters. They're like, yeah, we're kind of agreeing with Thomas, but we don't want to say it out loud because it would kind of, you know, look bad in here. But they're like, they're right there and very intense on what's happening. They want to see, is Jesus real? Is this hand really touching something that's real? And they're so into it that way. Um, and I, I, don't know, I just find this a beautiful painting. The looks on all their faces is that, but just thinking about the power of that moment, right? The power of that, like, you know, you want it, you wanted to touch my side, you wanted to touch my hands, let's do it. Right? And of course, this reminds us of the physicality of Jesus. You know, Jesus is a real man. He was fully God and fully man. And, uh, and he's still fully man. He's better man after the resurrection. It's that after the resurrection body that Jesus has. That's our future hope. We can also have physical bodies like Jesus's that are immortal, that go with us going forward. But his immortal body still carries his wounds right? Still carries his wounds because that's how we are saved by his wounds, or as Isaiah puts it, by his stripes, right? We are healed. Here's a Rembrandt, a very famous Rembrandt uh, called The Prodigal Son. So you're all probably familiar with The Prodigal Son, uh, a parable of Jesus. It's one of his most famous, um, found in Luke 14. You know, the, you know, so we know the story, right? The young boy runs away from his dad, takes his inheritance, squanders it all, and then comes back. And it's basically like life would be better um, back as a servant, not even as a son, right? And so he comes to, uh, to his father. Right? And it's uh, read now Luke 14. Let's pick up around uh, verse uh, 20 way off his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him and the son said to him father i have sinned against heaven and before you i am no longer worthy to be called your son but the father said to his servants bring quickly the best robe and put it on him put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate for this my son was dead and is alive again he was lost and is found and they began to celebrate and of course, the older brother is not uh, not super happy about this idea. I think you know here we have you know the father right is bringing the son in. The son is is being brought into fellowship with them. I like how it seems like his shoes are like falling apart there. You can see like his one ones come off his foot <laughs> there even as he's as he's kneeling. He needs these new shoes. And then we have the 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 household around kind of watching this scene. Probably have a sister there in the background who seems happy about this. I think the guy sitting down who kind of has a scowl on his face is probably 
the older brother, right? Then we have this older gentleman here, maybe a steward in the house or, or some other servant is looking on with kind of compassion, glad that this uh, this boy is back. Just the acceptance, right? The bringing the the bringing the son back in. Um, I, don't know, I just find this a beautiful, uh, beautiful piece of uh, reflecting on that passage and the importance of, of uh, returning, right? We all sin. We all um, need forgiveness and return. And God is lavish in his grace like the uh, the father in that story. Uh, Tim Keller has written a book called Prodigal God, actually, that says that's really what the story should be called or, or the story of the two brothers, maybe. But, uh, but it's God who is the one who's so lavish in his in his giving that we see in that as, as he's obviously the, the father. There's obviously a symbol for uh, for God ourselves. Okay, we've got two more. Uh, I added these lakes. They didn't make the the sheet, <laughs> but um, these are uh, are two more Caravaggios. I'm a big Caravaggio fan. Um, so this is Saul on the uh, the road to Damascus, right? So this is found in Acts nine. Right? So there's Saul on the ground, he's just fallen off um, the horse, right? And so um, pick up here in verse one of Acts nine. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you'll be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. I find this painting very interesting because until I saw this painting the first time, maybe it's because I just don't have a very vivid imagination, but I had never imagined Saul falling on his back. <laughs> I'd always thought that the depiction of Saul when it says, you know, he fell to the ground. It's sort of like he got off the horse and he bowed down before God. But I feel like, like here, it's almost like he's been knocked off his horse onto his back. And this, if, if you know, think about like in wrestling terms or something, right? Like, like this is a pretty bad position for Saul to be in. He's exposed. He's vulnerable. He's on his back, just laying before um the voice of Christ. We have a servant here who's you know, one of the people who's hearing this but not sure what's going on. But um, I feel like this this makes the Saul seem even less of an active participant in it, right? He's it's being this is God's just gracious favor being done to him. Right? He's not like, oh, I realize the errors of my ways. He's been blown back by the coming of Christ to him. It's like, what's going on? Who are you? And he's in a completely kind of humiliated and subservient position, not of his own doing, but of Christ's doing to him that breaks him and remakes him into the man who then will go on and write so much of the New Testament and be such an influential leader in the early church and his teaching and in his theology. So as I said, to me, it's, it's, it's made me think about kind of the way in which um, I personally will sometimes want to be like, well, I can do this on my own. But like, I need to, to rely upon the work of Christ and remember that I, I too am prone before him. I'm not, I don't bring anything to the table um, that he doesn't already have. He uh, can use me as his tool in any way that he uh, wants or desires. My right, last one here is... Uh, so I said earlier at the very beginning, I kind of teased this one. I said, well, see a crucifixion that's not Jesus. Because almost always, if you're seeing a, cru a cru crucifixion scene, it's Jesus. But this is not Jesus. And there's a couple of reasons why we know it's not Jesus. So you have to have a really good reason. The main reason why we know this is not Jesus is he's being crucified upside down. And I noticed that it's the feet that are being lifted up, not the head. All right? And then also, it's an old fellow. Right, Jesus wasn't that old when he was crucified. So this is Caravaggio's crucifixion of Peter. And right, to read John 21, we can get kind of maybe a glimpse of this. The, the church's tradition has always said that Peter was crucified upside down because when he was going to be killed under Nero, um, he requested it because he didn't think he was worthy to be killed in the same manner as Christ. So they flipped him over and said, well, we'll crucify you upside down instead. Um, John 21 um, maybe gives us a little bit of a hint to this. So starting in verse 15. 
When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. So he said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. And so here we have Peter, like I think you'll, uh, like when and he's there, like, He's, it's almost like he's looking at his left hand that's stretched out as Jesus has told him, right? Some of your hands will be stretched out and some will take you where you do not want to go being as it's hammered into the, the thing. And it's like, he's in my mind, I think he's like recalling this conversation that he has with Jesus that this, this is that moment I've been stretched out, been led where I do not want to go. Right? And here it is. And, but this is the, you might say the cost of, of following Jesus. You know, Jesus tells his disciples, right? Take up your cross and follow me. You know, count the cost, right? And Peter, as we know, like he heard all of this, right? And Christ says, follow me. And we know Peter did, right? We see in Acts, Peter preaching, bringing the gospel, right? He's not afraid to, to do this because he knows what knowing Christ and being found with Christ, um, the value that that is. And so this is but a short time of pain and agony to enter into the bliss of the resurrection life from Christ. We all have um, to look forward to. So um, that's the last one I have. Um, oh, I have uh, time for, yeah, anybody have any uh, any questions or, or comments? I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can see all of your faces here. Oh, I'm glowing here. It's like I've got my own halo going on with the sun coming in. Wow, let's see. <laughs> let's see if I can. Ah, oh, there we go. That's oh, that's better there. Okay. <laughs> All right. Do we have any questions, comments, thoughts? Yes, John. Oh, you're still muted. I think. There you go. No. Oh. You're muted. Gotta unmute yourself, John. No, you're still muted. I can't hear you. <laughs> well, then we'll figure that one out. Well, nobody have any questions or, or comments or thoughts. So I, I've really enjoyed um, doing these. I've enjoyed uh, our, our time together. I hope it's been a blessing to uh, to you. It's been interesting and informative and um, may give you some ideas of how you can uh, you know, maybe shape your own spiritual life <laughs> in this odd, odd time of pandemic and isolation and everything. Um, one of the things I really like about uh, these studies of art and looking at this Christian art is it reminds me in one sense that we're, you know, we're not alone, right? That there have been people who have been thinking and reflecting on the Christian faith for a very long time and trying to serve Christ and that we are not, um, uh, we're not the first people <laughs> to do this. We're part of a long, uh, long train of believers, great cloud of witnesses, as Hebrews says, um, that uh, that is a joy to be uh, to be part of. Josh, I think this is really, really good. This this fourth one is just kind of a capstone on all all of what you talked about. And it's, it's great to reflect. I, I, I feel like I need to go back and look at the first and the second ones again now. But I did, as I was, I was mentioning to you earlier today, I'm is putting together this devotional for Advent. I'm really mm -hmm. recognizing I didn't have graphics in there. So I do have Handel's Messiah in there, and I think that's yeah. pretty good. But yep. uh, some graphics, I think, will really improve it. So we'll, 
we'll be having that out in the next three or four days and all. Yeah. I'll send, yeah. send a uh, notice about it to all of you. Thanks again. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. All right, we're gone. Off in the recording.